Hello, good afternoon, DevOx. We live in interesting times, don't we? And I'm not talking about politics. If you look over the past few years in the software world, we've gone from big design up front to, in some cases, no design at all, which is bad. We've gone from creating lots of excessive documentation to nothing. We've got this no, or no, uh, no estimates thing, which doesn't mean don't do estimates, of course. We've got this whole no projects thing, which is the same thing. And now, monoliths versus microservices. We pitch these things as extremes. We pitch them against each other. Monoliths, on the one hand, we build everything into a single code base, a single deployable thing. We have tooling to support this. We know how to do this. We've been doing this for years. Refactoring simple. If we want to make a single one-line code change, we have to redeploy the whole thing. On the other hand, we have microservices. You, instead of deploying a single thing, you break your thing into lots of things. These things can be built in different languages. They can have technology agnostic interfaces. We can scale these things easily. It gives us a lot of agility. We can do polyglot programming and persistence. But there's a lot of complexity here, especially around the operational and um, you know, monitoring type concerns. The hidden assumption with the whole monolith thing, of course, is that they're evil. Monoliths are horrible, big balls of mud. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. And I've been saying this for years. There's nothing new here, essentially. I wrote a tweet about this a while back. I'll keep saying this. If people can't build monoliths properly, microservices won't help. 244 retweets. Woo. I was quite proud of that. Upclassed by the architect Clippy. I see you have a poorly structured monolith. Would you like me to convert it into a poorly structured set of microservices? No. Thank you. 4,031 retweets. What? How do we upclass the architect Clippy? Poo. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this slide. So that's kind of setting the scene. I live in Jersey, uh, Jersey and the Channel Islands. Sorry, the echo is really weird here. Uh, so there's Jersey on the map. Can you see Jersey? Not really, even on this gigantic screen. If we pinch the zoom in, get a bit closer. Pinch one more time. There we go, there's Jersey. So it's a small island, nine miles by five. Uh, population about 100,000 people. I'm the author of these two books here. Uh, so software architecture for developers. And, and this is really about making architecture much more accessible to us as software developers. I'm also the creator of this thing here called Structurizer. And Structurizer is some uh, web-based tooling that lets you visualize, document, and explore your software architecture. In essence, if you like web sequence diagrams, plant UML, it's a way to create architecture diagrams and models as code. The reason I like visualization and diagramming is that if you have a good, well-structured software system, a good, well-structured code base, you can visualize it really, really easily. Imagine you have a big Java system. It's a million lines of code, maybe broken up into 100,000 classes. And let's say you give me your code base, and you want me to draw you some diagrams to visualize that code base. Well, what I'm not going to do is draw you 100,000 small boxes, you know, one per class. That's just a, a ridiculous thing to do. So I'm going to use abstractions instead. And abstractions, essentially, you know, it's about grouping smaller things together into bigger things. We don't call these things things. We call them modules, components, services, subsystems, layers. And abstractions allow us to reason about large or complex code bases. It's about reducing the cognitive load, essentially. And this is great because it allows us to describe a software system using a small number of things. But the caveat here, of course, is that these abstractions need to reflect the code. And often they don't. I go and visit organizations around the world, and they show me these beautiful-looking architecture diagrams. 
And then I say, that's, that's lovely, now show me the code. And the code's totally different. Uh, the two things never match, this happens a lot. One of the big problems we have here as an industry is that even now, in 2016, we don't have a common vocabulary. So we don't have a standard ubiquitous language to describe software, and specifically static structure. We think we do, but we don't. We often use words like module and component, and they're very vague and very fluffy. Let's imagine we're building the world's most boring web app. It's a web app talking to a database. This is, what we do. This is kind of what we do anyway, right? If you go look up the word component in the dictionary, it literally means part of. For some of us, the web app is a component of the entire system. And for other people, components live inside the web app. So that's one of the, the big problems we have here. And the way I solve this is by creating a very, very simple hierarchy of static structural building blocks that we can use that to then describe the static structure of our software. For me, a software system is made up of a number of containers. A container is something that simply runs your code, executes your code, or stores or hosts your data. In real terms, it's something like a JavaScript app, a server-side web app, Spring MVC, for example, a console app, a database schema, a file system, whatever. If we look inside those containers, for me, they are made up of components. So I want to use the word component to mean something running inside a container. It's a grouping of related functionality behind a nice clean interface. And because I mostly deal with Java, my components are made up from classes. And we're done. So this is a really nice, simple way to think about the hierarchy, the static structure, the building blocks. Once you have this sort of thing in mind, and you might have to take this and tweak it to fit the language that you're using, you know, functional, JavaScript, whatever, you can then draw some diagrams. And this is what I call my C4 model. Context, containers, components, and classes. Essentially, what I want to do is create a set of diagrams that are maps on top of the code base, where we can zoom in and out at different levels. Just to give you a really quick example here, when I moved back to Jersey in 2008, I created a site called Tech Tribes. It's a content aggregator for the local tech industry. It lists local people, businesses, blog posts, tweets, events, jobs, and so on. That's the context diagram for Tech Tribes. The box in the middle with the monkey, that's my thing. That's the thing I built. This diagram shows people, and it shows external system dependencies. We select it. We pinch to zoom in. We get to level two. So this is the container diagram for the Tech Tribe system. And all I've done is I've expanded out that monkey box. And it shows you there's a Spring MVC web app at the top, there's a standalone console app at the bottom, and a bunch of databases in the middle. We select this standalone console app, the thing that reaches out to the outside world and pulls data back. We select it, we pinch to zoom in, we get to components. So this diagram is showing you the components inside that console app, essentially. There's a spring scheduled task lurking in the middle. Gets kicked every 15 minutes. It uses a bunch of connectors at the bottom. They call out to the outside world. And there are some other components at the top that push data into the data stores. MySQL, Mongo, or the file system. There's a tweet component. The tweet component is a really boring, basic CRUD component. And all it does is it throws tweets into a Mongo data store and allows you to get them back out again. That's it. So we select it, we pinch to zoom in, and then we can see the implementation details of that component. Oh. The sharp-eyed amongst you m might have realized something's gone wrong here. On the previous diagram, I said there was a tweet component. There is no tweet component on this picture. The initial implementation of the Tech Tribes application was a layered architecture. It was a fairly standard, typical layered architecture. Web stuff, business logic stuff, data access stuff. 
And that's what this diagram is showing you. It's a, it's a class diagram showing you that there was a, a service layer, there was a service package with a bunch of stuff in it, and there was a data access package or layer. And nothing on this diagram says tweet component. So where's the component? It's gone. On my diagram, I have this nice, chunky abstraction called a tweet component. And when you look at my code, I've lied to you. I just totally disappeared. And of course, you might say, well, it does really exist. So, you know, it's a combination of these interfaces and classes operating across a layered architecture. So it consists conceptually. Yeah, but it doesn't exist in the real world, does it? I've basically made something up and I've lied to you. I've told you a different story. And that comes back to this thing, you know, you have a bunch of diagrams that's showing things like components, and then you open up the code and they never quite match. George Fairbanks has written a fantastic book about software architecture. It's called Just Enough Software Architecture. And he calls this the model code gap. Essentially, we have a model of our system. It's a high-level model. We use terms like component, module, subsystem, layer to describe the architecture. But we don't have these same concepts and constructs in the languages that we use to, to write programs. So I'm guessing a bunch of you are Java developers here, given we're at a Java conference mostly. In Java, is there a layer keyword? No. Is there a component keyword? No. Same thing. We, what we do when we're creating things like layers and components is we're grouping together interfaces and classes inside packages. That's typically what we do. Okay, in Java 9, hopefully we'll get modules. In OSGI, we have modules. But you know, typically, we're, we're creating things like layers by using the basic constructs we have in our languages. So the two worlds don't match. This is not a new problem, of course. I found a paper from the, uh, the 90s. And even in the first two opening paragraphs, it basically says the same thing. Ask an engineer to draw you a picture of the system they're working on. You get a nice high-level picture. Reverse engineer a diagram from the code, and you get a very low level but accurate diagram, but it's totally different to the one that the engineer draws. It's two very different ways and models to think about the same thing. So although we often think and have architecture discussions in terms of stuff like components, we're not using these things in languages. We're using classes and interfaces and namespaces and packages. And a lot of time, we're still doing this layered architecture thing. So let's imagine we're building a web app. We're going to have some sort of controller layer with web app stuff. We're going to have some sort of business logic layer. And we'll have some sort of data access layer. This is a, a fairly traditional, typical pattern. And I, see, uh, I still see this a lot. Why do we do this? Well, the books tell us to. Here's a, a picture I stole from a Spring book. It basically says, if you're writing a Spring web app, do this. It has a bunch of layers. You turn the page, it tells you why. Substitutability, testing, separation of concerns, blah, blah, blah. You download some sample code off, the, off GitHub. It's already created that layer structure for you. You go to Stack Overflow. I'm building a new Java system. How do I structure my code base? Somebody goes, ah, oh, there's a Maven archetype that can do your layered architecture for you. OK. Same in the .NET world, Ruby, whatever. So we're being pushed and encouraged to create these layered architectures. Now, this is often what we call package by layer in the Java world. So we take our code and we package it in a horizontal layering strategy. And this is normally a strictly layered approach. So our controllers should only call our services. And our services should only call our data access objects. And this makes perfect sense, of course. In order to do this in Java, what we normally do is each of these red boxes is a package. That's how most people do this. In order 
to call something in a different package, you have to start making lots of your code public. And since or once you have lots of code that's public, there's actually nothing stopping you calling from your controller right down to your data access thing, you know, bypassing the service. And that's why, although we start off with this architecture and it's all nice and everybody's happy, over time, without checking and discipline, you get a mess. And this is ultimately what happens to layered architectures if they're left unchecked. And of course, the tooling doesn't necessarily help here. There are some tools you can plug into your build process that do things like architecture violation checking and, uh, and those sorts of things, but I, I don't see many people using them. You might be thinking, well, this layer stuff is like 10 years ago. We don't do layers. We do ports and adapters or hexagons or clean architectures. That may be so, but guess what? These are just layered architectures too. I'll prove this to you shortly. Should we consider layers as evil and harmful? I think that's a bit extreme, especially for you know just after lunch on day one of a conference. But I think we have the wrong idea of layers and software. If you look at something like the OSI network stack with the seven layers, each layer builds on top of the layer underneath and provides additional abstraction. In, a, in the software world, our layers are something different. So our UI is not a more abstract version of our database, for example. There's a great talk by Ralph Westphal. And if you skipped about 13 minutes in, he, he has a whole comparison between OSI and the software stack. And he says they're totally different. So we should perhaps stop thinking about doing layers. There's also something called cargo cult. And a cargo cult is basically doing stuff, but we don't really know why. You know, blindly applying something without really understanding the reason behind it. And perhaps layering is another cargo cult. Maybe that's a better way to think about this. You know, we're just blindly adopting this layering approach to our code, but we're not quite sure why. Maybe layers are important, but maybe something else is more important. Maybe the layers are just an implementation detail of a bigger construct. And maybe it's that bigger construct that we need to understand and figure out and discover. There was a great blog post by Uncle Bob Martin a while back called Screaming Architecture. And he says, if you look at most code bases, especially web apps, if you look at most code bases, they all look eerily the same. Because mostly the top level organizational structure is around horizontal layer or technology. Web stuff, business stuff, data stuff. And he says, this is different from the building world. If you look at the blueprints for a library, it screams, this is a library, given the various spaces and things. Likewise with houses and hospitals and schools. So maybe our code base needs to scream something more about the domain we work in. Martin Fowler wrote a post on his Blicky called Presentation Domain Data Layering. And he says, this layered architecture thing is a good starting point. It's very simple. A lot of the tooling is set up to help us do this. However, once you start to get any significant size or complexity in your application, you need to start modularizing inside the layers. One example he gives is, is what's typically referred to as package by feature. So instead of doing the horizontal layering, you do vertical layering. The vertical layering is typically based around uh, a DDD aggregate route or a domain concept or a feature set, something like this. So this is another way to organize your code. Essentially, you have the controller, the service, the data access stuff sitting in the same package. So now when you look at the top level organizational structure of your code base, you can see domain concepts and features. This is nice, but it doesn't necessarily solve any problems. Because if you have feature set A and feature set B, and they're nice and decoupled and isolated, and then feature set C comes along, and it needs something from A, well, now you need to make something in A public again. 
and the big ball of mud ensues. George Fairbanks to the rescue. George is my hero. He says, what we should use is an architecturally evident coding style. It's a great way to minimize and hopefully eliminate that model code gap. An architecturally evident coding style is essentially dropping hints and metadata into your code so that your code reflects your architectural ideas and intent. That sounds very grandiose. In real terms, it's something like, let's use naming conventions. So we have a box on our diagram. It's named logging component. Let's make sure we can see a logging component thing named in the code. Maybe it's about namespacing and packaging conventions. Maybe there's one namespace or package per component. Maybe it's about adding machine readable metadata, you know, annotating your components with an at component annotation. Things like Java modules, OSCI modules, Maven modules. Again, maybe there's a module boundary that corresponds to a box on the diagram, for example. The way that I organize my code is, is using a technique I call package by component. And what I really want to do, essentially this is a poor person's Java 9 module system, given what we have today. And what I'm doing is I'm putting each component in its own separate Java package. So I treat my web stuff as a separate component, and I bundle together the service and the repository, the data access logic, into a component. It's a really simple refactoring. So if I go back to my tweet service example, the class diagram on the left is what I had before. So there was a tweet service interface and a really horribly named default tweet service implementation class. That used or depended on a tweet data access object interface, with, and there was a Mongo implementation. So what I've done is I've taken my tweet service, rehoused it in a different package, and I've renamed it to be tweet component. So now it matches that box I had on my diagram. We're all good so far. Default tweet service is horribly, horribly named. I do apologize. So what I did is I refactored it and I renamed it to something even better, of course. Now it's called Tweet Component Impl. Okay, that's not an improvement as far as naming goes. However, what I've done is I've made it package protected. Right, so no one else can see it. It's an internal component implementation detail. So who cares what it's called? The Tweet DAO I deleted. I'm going to come back to that later because there's a bit of controversy around that. And the Mongo implementation I just shipped over as is. And I've also made that package protected. So essentially what I have here is a public interface and some package protected component implementation details. So now if you want access to my list of tweets, you have to go through that tweet component interface. You can't cheat and go straight to the DAO. You can go straight to database, but please don't do that. So we, we have a way to start enforcing some architectural integrity here. From a code perspective, uh, this is what it looks like. I have a component super package. Everything underneath that is a separate component. You can see here on the left, those are all of the files, including the spring config associated with that individual component. And I've also added an at component annotation. The at component annotation has nothing to do with this talk whatsoever. However, if you go and find these things, you can draw diagrams from them really easy, and that's what Structurizer does, essentially. So now going back to our component diagram, we have our tweets components at the top. We select it, we highlight it, we pinch the zoom in, hooray. So now we have a much cleaner progression from you know, these coarse, high-level abstractions down into the code. What I'm trying to do here is really introduce or reintroduce modularity as a, a thing we think about, a principle. Right, let's get people thinking about building nice, neat, modular, in this case, monolithic applications. One of the things microservices does really well is introduce a set of impermeable boundaries via the network, of course. You have a bunch of code. It's sitting behind a remotable interface. If you want to use that microservice, you have to go through the remote interface. 
You can't see inside it. I'm trying to do the same thing with Java in a world where we don't quite have Java 9 modules yet. In order to do this, you need to make some design decisions. And you have to start asking people, well, how do you actually design software? If you want 10 minutes of entertainment, grab a coffee and go and ask your team how they design software. It's brilliant. Nobody can answer this question. It normally starts out with things like, uh, we take requirements and we create a design. Right? How do you do that? Well, we do it at a whiteboard. Right? What are you using the whiteboard for? We're drawing pictures. What are you drawing pictures of? Our design. Yes. Exactly what are you drawing on the whiteboard? Boxes and arrows. What do the boxes represent? Components. See slides 15 minutes ago. How did you decide to draw three components and not two? I'm using my experience. What? Well, none of this makes any sense. And eventually I get to the point where I say, look, what's your decomposition strategy? How are you taking the problem space and decomposing it into smaller things? And they're like, I don't know, we're using my experience again. It's like, just go look it up on Wikipedia, for goodness sake. Like, there's a whole Wikipedia page on decomposition paradigms. OO, DDD, functional decomposition, volatility-driven decomposition. There are lots of ways to decompose a, a thing into smaller things. And sometimes this amazes people. It's like, yeah, this is a computer science concept. Just go look it up. In the 70s, Parnas wrote one of the classic papers on the criteria to be used in decomposing systems into modules. And he takes uh, the same application and decomposes it two ways. And the trade-offs and the benefits of the two different approaches are enormous. And again, that's what I want to get people thinking about. One of the nice things I actually think microservices has done is it's reintroduced us as an industry to design, and specifically stuff like decomposition. So we have our module monolith. How do these components interact inside our monolithic code base? Again, you've got options. It doesn't all have to be synchronous method calls. You could do stuff synchronously or asynchronously. You could throw a a local message event bus thing in there, or we could throw messages out to a proper you know, distributed messaging system. You could throw events around your monolithic application. All of these are design choices that you get to make. Where do you put your domain classes? Do you put your domain classes inside your component boundaries? That's one approach. Or do you have like a big bag of domain stuff? that all your components share. Again, why not? Again, there are trade-offs with each of these approaches, and you get to choose. You try it and refactor if it doesn't work. Shared code and utils. It's the same with the microservices world. Do we share code across our microservices, or do we copy-paste? Do we do a you know, open-source GitHub-style thing where people pull whichever version of some shared code they need? Again, entirely up to you. You get to choose. And this doesn't stop at the code. Normally, it's the, the database and the data model that is that horrible big ball of mud. It's normally that that's really, really hard to untangle. And again, just because all of your code is in a single monolithic Java app, it doesn't mean you can't use polyglot persistence. Why not? Source stuff in Mongo here, MySQL here, Cassandra here. Why not? Again, it's all decisions. And these need to be conscious decisions. Not just we're doing stuff because we think we should. You know, we've always built a gigantic Java system running against an even more gigantic Oracle database. And that's the way we do things here. Right? Stop that. Start thinking. The devil here is definitely in the implementation details. Right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna blow some UML at you. So there are four UML class diagrams here. And these represent different architectural approaches to structure code in a web app, for example. So let's imagine we're building a web app, and it's doing something with customers. On the very left is what we might typically see in a, layered, a traditional layered architecture. There's a customer controller, 
doing web stuff. There's a customer service doing some business logic, and there's a customer DAO. Right, so fairly traditional, fairly simple. The next one along is what you typically might see with a ports and adapters, or a hexagonal style of architecture. For those of you who don't know what a ports and adapters architecture is, basically there's an inside and an outside. The inside is where all of the business and domain logic sits. The outside is, is your interface to the technology world. The box in the center containing the customer service, customer service impl, and customer repository, we can argue about naming, that's the inside, that's the business part, and the top and bottom are the web and the data access. The third one, that's what you might see with a package by feature approach. So we have a single Java package, all of the customer stuff sits inside it. Easy. The one on the, on the right is what I do, what I call package by component. So my customer controller is a separate component, and all of the other customer stuff is a separate component. When I was putting this talk together, and following some feedback from previous editions of this talk, I, I really tried hard to find a good canonical example of a port and adapters architecture on the internet. And I couldn't find one. And this really surprised me. And what I see with most ports and adapters architectures is that all of the Java classes, all of the Java types, are made public. Go read the books, go look on GitHub, you'll find the same thing. People don't care too much about using the Java access modifiers. And they just write all their code as public. I can see some people smiling in the audience now. This is obviously ringing some bells. The thing here, of course, is, is all, if all of your Java types are public, there is absolutely no use in using packages. Packages are designed to give you some sort of encapsulation. If you're not using the access modifiers, there is no encapsulation. Essentially, you're, you're just using packages as an organizational structure, like folders. This has some interesting implications. So here's a really neat trick. If, we sh if I show you that diagram again, and I take away all of the package boundaries, because they don't matter, because in this case, let's imagine all the types are public, we get this. I felt the intake of air then. All of the diagrams are exactly the same. So if you make all of the type public, or all of the types public, there's actually no difference between these architectural styles. You have to shift the boxes around to line them up, but there's no semantic difference. Odd, huh? So although we like to think of these as conceptually different architectural styles, if we abuse Java's access modifiers and make everything public, they're all just exactly the same. So that's why, and this explains why most ports and adapters architectures just look like glorified layers, essentially. However, Java's packages, although not perfect, have some use. And if we bring back the packages and we start to fade out with the use of color, the Java types that can be made more restrictive package protected in this case, we get a very interesting picture. So you have to work this through in your mind. With the layered architecture example, because our controller depends on the customer service interface, the implementation class can be made package protected. The, the caveat here is you need to be able to instantiate one of those things, and DI frameworks like Spring will quite happily instantiate uh, non-public classes. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but I like it. Uh, same with the DAO. With the ports and adapters model, it's exactly the same. You can make your JDBC customer repository implementation uh, package protected, provided you can provide an instance of it. Uh, and the service implementation, again, depends on the repository interface. <laughs> 
with the package by feature approach, you do need an entry point into that package. Some web app frameworks force you to be public, some not so much. But then everything inside that package can be made package protected. The caveat here, of course, is if you need to access that customer business logic from outside the package, you need to start making stuff public again, which is why I prefer my option on the right here. So my customer controller, that's my public entry point. There's nothing else there. And I have a single interface for my customer component. So again, that's quite interesting. You know, applying Java's access modifiers allow you to do some very interesting things here. Testing, right? So this talks about to get a little bit more controversial than it already has. Has anybody seen this? If you've not seen this, you should. I highly recommend it. You won't agree with a lot of it, most of it, if I'm honest. However, there's some really, really good nuggets in here. And one of them is, you know, if we look back 10 or 15 years, we did lots of mocking of stuff. So we're writing some code against our database. We want to write unit tests against our database. Well, that's slow. So what we do is we mock out our database, and now our tests run fast. Hooray. If we fast forward to 2016, I've got a, a MacBook Retina here, 16 gig of RAM, nice fast disk. We have Docker and Vagrant, and I can spin up a database environment in a number of seconds, a small number of seconds of that. So some of the arguments we use for doing lots of mocking and stuff in the past are no longer as applicable as they were. There was lots of controversy called by this paper. Uh, DHH, the Rails guy, jumped on this and went, yeah, I totally agree. Don't let your test drive your design. And it sounded like on the face of it, he was attacking TDD. And I think what he was really saying here is don't chop your code base up into lots of really tiny parts just to make your code base testable. I do see this with things like Spring, for example. Because you can dependency inject everything, people do literally dependency inject everything. And then you have these millions of things running around at runtime, and it's really hard to figure out what on earth is going on. You know, maybe we need to only dependency inject the larger chunks. But go back to my tweet example. I said I got rid of and I removed the tweet data access object interface. So the question becomes, how do I unit test my Mongo DB tweet DAO? I can't. But more, more interestingly, how do I unit test my tweet component impl without talking to the database? I can't. I've hardwired these two things together. I have no way to produce a substitute Mongo, uh, MongoDB tweet DIO here. OK, some of the mocking frameworks will let you do that. But it's kind of hard. I've made my life harder now. You'll notice I still have a layered architecture here, by the way. So I have a component boundary, and I have layers inside my components, so I can switch out Mongo really easily. But I can't test it in isolation so, so easily. The simple answer is, I don't do unit testing. Right, that's it. We can move on now. <laughs> Coming back to the cargo cult thing, I wonder if we apply the same principle to unit testing. Right, we've just been taught to do lots of very low-level unit testing. Why? Why is this a good idea? Is it a good idea? in my current code base. Because I've worked on systems that have been very integration heavy, and we've literally had like three unit tests across the entire code base. But we've had lots of automated tests at a much higher level of abstraction. And I'm going to bring the testing pyramid triangle thing into play here. And this is the typical traditional advice. We do lots of very fast running low level unit tests. These cover a large percentage of our code base. This, on the face of it, sounds like really, really good advice. What is a 
unit? I don't know. If I was to poll everybody here, we'd get hundreds of different versions of what a unit is. For some people, a unit is a class. For others, it's a single method. For other people, it's not about static structural and, and, and building blocks. It's about behavior and features. So there's no easy definition of unit, but we're basing a lot of stuff on this definition. So let, let's forget that. If you're really lucky, you might have some integration tests. These are the things that are slow, they're brittle, they always fall over the weekend, and you just at ignore them. Yeah, I've done this as well, right? What's an integration test? Well, for some people, an integration test is integrating units. Oh, great, now we're back to this thing again. What is a unit? What are we integrating? The more common definition of, a, of, of an integration test is that we're integrating with something outside of our control or something slow like a, a database or the internet or a microservice or whatever. If you're super lucky, you might have some UI functional acceptance tests on top, perhaps automated. So on the face of it, this is really good advice. And this gives us lots of options. So if I'm putting some good component boundaries around, say, my service and my, and my repository in this case, I can test the service in isolation by mocking out the repository. There are ways we can do that. I can write some integration tests uh, you know, with the repository thing against the real database. Or I could just component test the whole thing through the public component interface. And that's what I do in my tweet component. So I don't unit test it, but I do have a bunch of automated tests. And they basically spin up an instance of the tweet component. And they use the public interface and go all the way back to Mongo and back again. And this is good because I own the Mongo stack. Mongo is very fast. I can spin it up. I can kill it off. So because I own the whole stack, this makes a lot of sense in this situation. And what I'm really trying to say here is instead of blindly unit testing everything at a very low level of abstraction, why don't we perhaps think about shifting our testing focus up a level? Now, let's figure out if we do have some structurally significant building blocks like components, why don't we test those instead? A bunch of caveats apply. This is no silver bullet by any means. This works really well if you own the whole stack. So with my tweet component, I do own the whole stack. I own the Mongo schema. I can spin the whole thing up. If I'm dealing with asynchronous behavior, then I might need to start introducing mock points because that gets a bit tricky. If I'm talking to a third-party service over the internet, I'm going to have to start introducing a mock point because that's often not going to work, for example. So you have to take this approach and, and see if it works for what you're building. I, I really don't like that testing triangle. I think the terms are ambiguous, and, and I don't think it's very helpful. What I want to do is really start aligning the tests we write with the code we create. The shape is not necessarily too important here, you know, triangles versus house shapes. I want to get away from the naming as well. So rather than me just using the word unit test, I want to use the word or the term class tests. So, so my class tests test a single class at a time, you know, mocking out other classes around them. This is typically what we mean by unit tests. They're very fast, they're very low level, they're very precise. They do a very limited amount of, of testing and work. So those are my class level tests. If we step up one level, in my code base, I have a bunch of larger, slightly slower running component tests. And these spin up the components and test through the public interface. If we step up even further, I have some system level tests that poke my system from the outside. This is your automated API and you know, Selenium web driver type tests. We might do the same sort of thing in a microservices world as well. 
Imagine you're building a microservice in Java. You might have a bunch of class-level tests testing it inside the microservice. And you might have a, a bunch of service-level tests on top testing that service through its public remotable interface. The reason I've used this naming is because I think the names of the tests need to reflect the constructs they're testing. So that's the way I think about this. I, I have to be slightly careful with this next slide because people will photograph it and take it out of context. So what I want to do is I want to achieve the maximum level of code coverage from tests with the minimum amount of test code. There are extremes, of course. On the one hand, I could write one absolutely gigantic Uber test from the outside of my system that tests the entire system from the outside. And that's a horrible, horrible idea. On the other side, we break our system up into millions of small things, and we unit test each of those millions of small things individually. Again, they're extremes. I think there's a nice, happy balancing point in the middle here. Writing component-level tests, in my experience, gives you a good chunk of code coverage with actually quite a small amount of test code. So again, caveat supply. It's a sliding scale. In essence, I want to link up the architecture, the way we think about and structure our software systems with the code, so reducing that model code gap. The code and the tests should relate to each other and the test should relate back to the architectural construct. And this is true whether you're doing monolithic, uh, micro, uh, sorry, monolithic modular systems or microservices. The same principle applies here. All of these three things should tally up. Why is this important? Quite simply, it's about maintainability of software. And the maintainability of our software is normally, well, it has some weird inverse proportional relationship with a number of stuff public classes, dependencies, or maybe the number of microservices. The more things we have, the harder our system becomes to understand, enhance, maintain. For me, a good architecture gives you agility. That's one of the things a lot of teams are kind of aiming for here. Let's create a code base that gives us agility, allows us to move fast, react to business change quickly. And agility is another quality attribute. It's another non-functional requirement. When we start out with our blank sheet of paper and we're trying to figure out, do we go microservices or monolithic or something in between, we ask ourselves this question, how much agility do we need? And we let the degree of agility guide that decision rather than just basing it on hype. And of course, it's not just extremes. There is something in the middle. And that middle ground is a modular monolith. You create a monolithic application. You make sure it's really, really well structured and modularized. And then if there are parts of that monolithic application that you think could benefit from being ripped out and made a microservice, well, then you do it. And because you've got nice seams and nice boundaries in your monolithic code base, it's easy to do. Again, caveat supply, your data model needs to be nice and um, decoupled as well but you're creating those nice modular things. You're creating those impermeable boundaries in your monolithic code base. You're minimizing the amount of things that can call inside your component. And for me, well-defined in-process components, living in a, a, a monolithic application, is a fantastic stepping stone to a microservices architecture. If, if the microservices architecture gives you some benefits that you are looking for. Polyglot programming, being able to scale it separately, version it separately, release it separately, and so on and so on and so on. So what I'm saying here is essentially choose a microservices approach, maybe in certain areas only, if it gives you benefits. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with a horrible, big, distributed ball of mud. And I really do not want that to happen. I see so many people who have this horrible, messy code base, and they think microservices will solve that problem. And to a degree, I grant you, it might, because you have some impermeable boundaries. 
You're putting networks in the way so people can't see inside your services. But it comes down to that design. It comes down to that decomposition. If you get your decomposition strategy wrong, and I'm sure Sam Newman will say this as well, you're basically just setting yourself up for failure. Some closing thoughts. If your software system today is hard to work with or maintain or enhance, it's up to you to change it. Right? Do the architectural refactoring. Start putting in some seams and boundaries and think about how to modularize your existing code base. Think about how to align the software architecture view of your system with the code. Think about George Fairbanks's architectural evident coding style. Think about potentially dropping some hints and metadata into your code so that your code reflects your architectural ideas. You end up with a nicer bunch looking at a nice bunch of diagrams that reflect the reality of your code base. What concrete advice can I give you today, right here, right now? What advice can I give you that will start fixing your mess? Stop making every class public. Right? It's as simple as that in many cases. Start using Java's access modifiers but in a better way, more appropriately. Some might say properly. When we get to Java 9, jump on Java 9 and start minimizing the surface of the things, the modules that you're building. You know, it's the separation between public and published interfaces. I can't force you to do this. It's muscle memory. Every time I find myself writing a class, if I'm not using tooling, I go public class, oh, without thinking, damn. The IDEs will create public classes by default half the time. The to other tooling will do the same thing. I don't know how we fix that problem. I can incentivize you, though. Every time you do this without thinking, you stick a euro in a charity pot. A euro is worth a lot now, believe me. <laughs> it depends which side the, the boundary lives. So, yeah, start thinking about using Java's access modifiers properly. And my final closing thought is basically this. If you can't build a nice, well-structured, monolithic application, please don't go anywhere near microservices. Thank you very much.